President Biden starts an ambitious trip to the Middle East and Asia tomorrow, where he'll attend the COP27, G20, and U.S. ASEAN summits. Uh, it's, a, it's a big trip with a lot of issues on the table and lots of big questions. What should we be looking for from the Biden-Xi meeting at the G20, for example? Or how should U.S. policymakers be thinking about the G20 as an institution and its role in U.S. statecraft? What should the president be trying to achieve when he meets with ASEAN leaders in Phnom Penh? I'm Chris Chivas, the director of the Carnegie Endowment's American Statecraft Program, and I'm here with three great experts to dig into some of these issues. First of all, I have Evan Medeiros, who is the Penner Family Chair in Asia Studies at Georgetown University. He was a senior director for China in the Obama administration and has extraordinary depth uh, on these issues. Second of all, I have Beth Sanner, who is currently a senior fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard University and was previously the US Deputy Director of National Intelligence and also a director of the President's Daily Brief. Finally, I have my colleague, Stuart Patrick, who is the director of the Carnegie Endowment's Program on Global Order and Institutions and a longstanding expert on multilateral institutions and their role in US foreign policy. Thanks so much to the three of you for being here. Great to be here. I wanna start with Beth. Beth, this is a really complicated trip. And as I said, with so many issues on the table, you've been involved uh, in multiple different angles uh, from within the intelligence community and helping to prepare the packages uh, that go to the president uh, for this kind of a trip. I wonder what your thinking is about the kinds of opportunities uh, and risks that ought to be highlighted uh, for the president uh, and, his, and his team as they set out on the road tomorrow. What are you thinking? Well, I thought I might actually, Chris, talk first a little bit about what it's like to be in the Oval Office and how you put these things together. I briefed President Trump twice on these trips and I was um, deputy of Southeast Asia uh, and CIA. So I'm used to kind of putting these things together. And you know, the, if you put yourself in the Oval Office today, the morning before the president leaves this afternoon, there's only so much you can do, right? Um, and there are so many moving parts, so many different people involved. Um, but I would say that, you know, this is about bilats as well as what happens in these meetings. And so Biden met with all of these players really with the exception of two people. And so it's important during this trip for him to solidify relationships with people he already knows, but also um, in terms of Maloney and Marcus Jr. in the Philippines, it's an opportunity for him to um, you know, develop rapport with them, even though he's talked to them on the phone. So, you know, at the Intel briefer, you're not really supposed to be talking about policy, you're not advocating policy, but you're providing that framework of how do foreign leaders think about uh, what the U.S. administration's uh, themes and interests are. And so, you know, you would be breaking down, for example, I probably put together some charts on for each meeting or for each theme and break down where each person stands. And so when I would be putting this together for the Oval today, I'd probably be thinking about three big themes that cross, that span across all of these different meetings. The first is kind of the developed countries versus the global south. Um, and I know Stuart will want to talk about this, but this is one of the main geopolitical risks that we're seeing really come out in the COP27 discussions. And, um, you know, I might tee up this conversation by pointing to um, the Nigerian president's op-ed in the Post today and say, and ask, you know, have you had a chance to read um, that particular op-ed and use that as a jumping off point for how um, Russia and China are really trying to emphasize the difference in disinformation, misinformation, and just in the public speaking um, and trying to divide the United States from the global south and those challenges. Um, I would also, you know, kind of point to, you know, the bilateral meetings and some of these meetings having already been set, obviously, but there's the real potential of some people feeling slighted, like the Thai prime minister feeling slighted about um, the president not going to APEC, even though the vice president is going. And I mentioned Marcos, um, the vice president is going to the Philippines, but those are important. 
um, the relationship with the South African president. Uh, Biden met with him in the White House in September, but to reinforce um, those relationships because he's so important in this Global South conversation and not always on the U.S. page. Second big theme is China, China, China. Um, Evan will talk about that. Um, but I think that in terms of ASEAN, the Biden goes into ASEAN with some real benefits because she never goes to this. He spends his premier. Um, but Li Keqiang is not, um, he has not been re-upped for the standing committee after the party Congress. So you have a lame duck China person going, Putin never goes to this event. Uh, you have real questions from a lot of ASEAN players about, about China, about Xi's aggression coming out of the party Congress and what they saw um, with Pelosi's visit in Taiwan. So there's some real opportunities there even though Lee is in ASEAN for a six day visit right now and opening up some big, inaugurating some big infrastructure, just like he is in Indonesia. So I would be talking about how do players think about China? Um, and I'd also be talking about those four priorities in ASEAN, Myanmar and North Korea, and particularly North Korea and how China plays into that. And then the third thing, the Russian invasion of Ukraine permeates everything. And boy, what a sigh of relief the White House probably had um, yesterday and was obvious that Putin was not going to show up. Uh, it may be one virtual thing at the G20. Um, and But again, at ASEAN, we have some real benefits for Biden here because Hun Sen, the ca longtime Cambodian leader, has actually been really consistent on supporting Ukraine. He backed the... Um, they were one of the supporters of the sponsors of the UN um, vote on annexation on that resolution on annexation. He just spoke to Zelensky a couple of weeks ago. Um, he said he would come and visit Ukraine. They promised mining. Uh, Russia's kind of lost whatever luster it had in Southeast Asia. So again, some real benefits there, um, even though you have some traditional ties. So, you know, in this context, I might show, you know, not just who voted for what in the UN, but what are their positions on these issues? And most importantly, try to have a contextual conversation so you can talk about each player. And then when Biden has individual meetings, he can understand where each country and each leader is coming from. I'll stop there because there's a lot. <laughs> that's a, that's that's a fantastic uh, way to get us started. And it just reminds me what an enormous amount of work uh, goes into preparing the president for this kind of travel, not, certainly from the intelligence community, but across the whole of the U.S. government. So um, thank you for that. I mean, I have a number of things that I that I that I want to want to raise, but I, I wonder if we might um, explore a little bit an issue that you put on the table, uh, which is Russia and China's efforts potentially to use these. Uh, multilateral forums to divide uh, the United States and the global South. And I, and I actually want to go to to Evan first because he knows many of the countries uh, that are that are involved in in this, especially on the Asia portion of this trip. and and ask him for his thoughts on that. Does, does, do you Evan, do you see uh, that as you know as one of the big issues, uh, one of the big dynamics that's going to be playing out over the course of the the next several days as Biden has these meetings. And, and what are your thoughts on that angle? I do think it's going to be one of the fundamental dynamics, <clears throat> but it will also be the question of the depth and scope of American commitment to Asia, right? There, these are three meetings that are all in Asia, right? It's a unique convergence of the East Asia Summit, then the G20, and then APEC, and they're all in Asia. And so really what it is, is it's a test. It's a test of how committed the administration is to investing in the Asia Pacific. And the Chinese want, have been trying for years, almost decades, to suggest that um, you know, they are not only present in Asia, but they simply provide more um, benefits to Asian countries to try and short circuit what they see as American containment efforts, but also to just make themselves look more appealing. So this is a longstanding game. This is another test of that game. I think the Biden administration goes into it pretty well positioned because uh, it's important for, for listeners to be reminded that this is Biden's second trip to Asia this year. 
And it's also Vice President Harris's second trip to Asia. That's a pretty good setup in terms of signaling U.S. Uh, commitment to Asia. And of course, Biden also hosted all of the ASEAN leaders, or almost all the ASEAN leaders for a U.S. ASEAN summit in Washington earlier this year. So sort of the way to think about the U.S. versus China competition in Asia is Biden comes into this after demonstrating a pretty serious and sustained commitment uh, to the Asia Pacific. The challenge for Biden is twofold. Number one, is that nobody in Asia wants to choose between the United States and China, right? The great strategic truism of this new era of US-China strategic competition. And so Biden needs to signal that he is going, wants to pursue stability in the US-China relationship, that he's not um, committed to you know, long-term rivalry, that he wants to manage problems. So sort of finding that balance between demonstrating that America um, is deeply engaged in Asia but that it doesn't want to uh, ask countries to choose between the United States and China. So I think that's going to be one challenge for him. And the second challenge is to make an obvious point is demonstrating that America is going to be involved in the Asia growth story going forward. This is a perennial challenge for the U S once president Trump made the decision to withdraw the U S from uh, the trans Pacific partnership. Now, TPP subsequently went forward, renamed CPTPP, and uh, that and another regional trade agreement called the RCEP are really sort of driving the next round of trade liberalization in East Asia. And so not only demonstrating that um, Biden doesn't want countries to choose between Beijing and Washington, but also that the United States actually uh, can give Asia what it wants which is opportunities to benefit from the large and growing U.S. economy. Final point here, Chris, is I think China comes into this, um, these three big summits a little bit on the back foot. And Beth uh, very wisely alluded to this. Um, you know, the current premier, Li Keqiang, is a lame duck. He's going to go away in a few months. Um, so meetings with him are sort of useless. Xi Jinping just pulled off this, you know, sort of very, very, dictatorial, authoritarian looking um, uh, uh, political transition in which he just stacked the leadership with all of his key people, which doesn't make China look particularly, you know, open, transparent, accountable. But perhaps most importantly is the Chinese economy is slowing. Uh, some of the key sectors of the economy, like real estate, are contracting. And it's that sector that's been, um, you know, has driven a lot of the purchases of strategic commodities from Asia and especially Southeast Asia. And of course, the Chinese economy is changing. It's moving away from being driven by manufacturing, exports and investment to being driven more by consumption and services, which, cha which will change. It's already changing the economic relationship with Southeast Asia. So in other words, for China, you know, it comes into this with the whole Chinese value proposition to Asia changing. So that means is that Asian countries look at China and there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, is China going to get back to the 5% uh, GDP growth rate? Is China going to continue buying what I want to buy? Will the Chinese, you know, uh, allow me to sell into their market? You know, that sort of thing. And will the newly empowered Xi Jinping is he going to be aggressive and assertive now that he's totally consolidated power after 10 years? And I think all of those are headwinds to Xi Jinping's ability to present his value proposition to Asia. And so I think that that, um, that sort of constellation of issues, challenges and opportunities for Biden, challenges, opportunities for Beijing, sort of sets the strategic stage for the U.S.-China um, you know, competition going forward. That's 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 a fantastic lay down, Evan. Thank you. And, and maybe before I go to, to you, Stuart, I, I'll ask you a, a follow up on the question of how the United States actually threads the needle between demonstrating its commitment to the region on the one hand uh, and um, making the case that it's not really asking countries to make a stark choice between uh, Washington and Beijing. Is it is is the how important is just the fact of the trip as opposed to what uh, actually transpires during the trip? 
I mean, are there specific things that he really needs to, to do uh, in order to accomplish that? Or is a lot of it just in, uh, again, the fact that, he, that he's going, that he's spending so much time, uh, that the U.S. government is putting so much effort uh, into, this, uh, into this set of issues? Yeah, good question, Chris. I would say it's 70-30. So 70% showing up, given the fact that this is Biden's second trip to Asia. You know, he's had lots of interactions with Asians in Washington earlier this year and same thing for Harris. So I think that the administration goes into this meeting with actually quite a bit of momentum. Um, but I think what the, the one, if there's one thing that the region wants to see and needs to see is a constructive, productive U.S.-China summit, right? That is, that is the big kahuna burger mm -hmm. of um, Biden's Asia diplomacy, because that will project an image of being responsible in engaging in strategic competition. It will subtly send the message, we're, we don't want countries to choose because we ourselves don't want to choose, right? America has a $650 billion dollar annual goods trade relationship with China, that's not, that's not nothing. So being able to project that image of being engaged in Asia, attentive to what Asia needs, you know, uh, willing to continue um, working with Asia on its problems, but at the same time managing this new era of strategic competition with China well. I think all of those are really going to be important. So sure, showing up is, you know, is significant, but then showing up and really nailing those key points is going to be central to Biden's success uh, in the next week. That's great. And, and obviously, we want to get to uh, talking a little bit about the, the Biden-Xi meeting. But before we do that, Stuart, let, let, let me bring you in for, a, for any comments that, that you want to make on, uh, on what we've been talking about so far, but, but also... I'm interested in your thoughts about um, whether or not these multilateral fora are, are fit for purpose, um, or, or at least how you know they, they they ought to figure in American statecraft today and looking forward. With the G20 in particular, there are there 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 are um, obviously a number of of challenges. This is an institution that. We had we, the United States, along with others, had elevated to a very high level of strategic import, importance in real years, in recent years, based upon the observation that so much of global wealth is 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 represented there. Um, but yet now we find ourselves in a position where certainly, obviously, there is the, the, the challenge of, of Vladimir Putin and then also the ongoing tensions between the United States and President Xi, problems with uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and tensions uh, to some degree even with other countries. So, so how should we be thinking about these institutions and, and their role in U.S. statecraft? Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. And it's great to be here with, um, with all of you. Um, I mean, in, in many ways, it's kind of a tale of two multilateral groupings, right? Um, the G20, but then the G7 and how those have, in a sense, oscillated in U.S. calculations of which is, in a sense, the most a valuable informal uh, standing coalition or, or consultative body. Um, I mean, as you pointed out, we know when the G20 was created back, uh, you know, in the depths of the global financial crisis in, um, in November of uh, 2008, you know, declared itself the premier forum of, um, of global economic coordination. Um, you know, everybody basically had given up the, the G7, uh, which was the G8 at that point, including Russia, um, up for dead. But I think over time, I think, you know, the G20 has fallen victim, which is not really surprising to its extraordinary heterogeneity. Um, you know, the salad days were pretty short lived. Um, it did. It was admirable as a at least short term uh, crisis committee. But then it, it wasn't it never really emerged as a sort of enduring steering committee for the global economy or for other aspects of sort of international governance. Um, and I, it, what was interesting really also was that when the COVID-19 crisis uh, erupted, um, it didn't even uh, take on its firefighting role. Right. Um, and it, it just was um, the G20 and essentially essentially failed because it was hamstrung by uh, U.S. China geopolitical um, competition. So I think you know, one of the lessons is that, you know, you want to have the, one of these forums be a, a deus ex machina that somehow, you know, creates, a, you know, it solves all these problems magically. But the reality is that uh, that none of them are both all of them have imperfections, um, you know, because and then meanwhile, in the intervening years, the G8 now G7's uh, demise proved a little bit premature. Right. And because. Fortunately for the, the G7 members, uh, Russia, which had never been a particularly, um, uh, you know, natural partner within the, the G8, uh, was ejected uh, in two, uh, 2014 at, 
after um, Vladimir Putin's first invasion of Crimea, I mean, of, uh, of Ukraine and seizure of Crimea. Um, and so I think what you've seen, though, is that um, the importance of, of the G7 in comparison has only grown with rising ideological and geopolitical competition with these revisionist authoritarian powers. Um, and so, you know, it's been in, increasing the fulcrum, and particularly um, with the war in Ukraine, um, and along alongside uh, NATO and, uh, and 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 the other allied, U.S. allied structures. Um, the dilemma and danger for um, Biden going into um, this G20 summit, and and generally speaking, is that the vision of the world that he's been propounding is often fallen on deaf ears in much of the developing world. And that includes many of the emerging market economies within the G20. When, 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 and this was on, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, it was, it, it was definitely showcased when, um, um, Anthony Blinken and, and uh, met with his uh, foreign ministry counterparts um, this summer. There was a real effort. First of all, there had been an effort to try to make sure Putin wasn't invited to the G20. Obviously he's not going now, but, uh, but he wasn't actually invited. And, you know, um, the U.S. effort was uh, was was entirely in vain. And then when um, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, this summer tried to, you know, isolate in a sense uh, Ru the Russians, um, didn't uh, had, had virtually no success, um, and, and no success really, obviously, in engaging the Chinese on this in this uh, degree. So I see what you have when uh, President Biden's going to um, uh, to Bali. He's you know got a got a um, got a body that's really divided into, in a sense, three camps. Uh, there's the revisionist authoritarian powers in you know, Russia and uh, Russia and China. There's the West, basically, which is about 10 countries, uh, the G7 plus. And then, though, you have, you know, eight countries that are really uh, clinging to non-alignment and have no desire to get involved in a new Cold War uh, uh, with Russia and China. And uh, so they, as I mentioned, those are those dynamics have been quite, quite a bit in display. But um, I think that one of the, one of the dangers is that, um, or one of the things that that the that President Biden has to do when he gets to the meeting and beyond, is um, to take a close look at um, each of the emerging market economies that are in there and think about, in a sense, what their what their strategic calculations are. Um, uh, Beth was getting to getting to some of this um, in in terms of the the bilaterals. You know, all of these countries have equities with Russia, or for strategic and ideological reasons, uh, don't want to uh, rupture uh, rupture their non aligned uh, uh, status, including not least India, but also host Indonesia. Um, I think that uh, given this, what we have the, the dangerous um, dynamic right now for the United States in terms of statecraft is you have a world that's divided not only on east-west lines, but increasingly on north-south lines. You, you see this um, at COP27, which perhaps we can talk about, um, but you've seen it um, uh, in spades in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic, in the aftermath of the, the global in debt, in debt crisis that's going on. Um, so I think that you know, to rescue the G20 from irrelevance and also perhaps get some leverage with some of these countries, um, Biden needs to do, uh, he needs to show the leaders of these uh, emerging economies that he actually understands their priorities and the West is primed to launch some concrete initiatives along those lines. And there's a number of initiatives that I have in mind, but um, I won't go into any great detail, but uh, that includes uh, it, um, initiatives to address the mountain of debt of an emerging economies and developing countries, uh, ensuring that any dramatic moves that the United States and, and its allies make towards friendshoring actually doesn't hurt, uh, but actually helps some of the countries, including those at the G20. Um, and I think that there really needs to be an effort to deliver on climate financing, um, uh, not only for a clean energy transition and, uh, and adaptation, but, but then also for um, climate reparations, which is a huge issue uh, right now uh, at COP27. Um, so success in Bali, I guess I would say, would depend a lot less on scoring points against Russia and China um, than on whether the U.S. helps shift the substantive agenda on issues that, that sort of matter to the, these fence-sitting countries um, that the United States hopes to cultivate. And I'll stop there, uh, but happy to respond or follow up. Chris, can I add something to yeah, that? Yeah, Beth, I was, gonna, I was actually just going to ask you to come in, and then I want to be sure, yeah. since we have li somewhat limited time today, that we get to the uh, Biden-Xi uh, meeting. But Beth, please please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and I think that, you know, without pointing it out, there's a really good juxtaposition for the United States versus China on some of these key issues, like debt relief and on environment. Um, and I think that there's a tonal issue here, you know, that it has to be, Biden has to adjust the tone, right? It can't be about values. I think they're getting that message. Um, there are some countries that care about that. So you don't want to throw that away. I mean, something we believe in, 
But let's face it, the U.S. is actually a perpetrator of a lot of the pain in the developing world right now because of our interest rates and um, the high dollar, right? That's not designed to hurt them, but it is hurting them. And so I think we have to acknowledge that along with climate um, and figure out ways of, of being proactively um, understanding and help be part of the solution there in a way that I don't think China can be. I mean, they're not they're not able to be in a lot of ways. They don't want to be. Can I can I pick up on that just really quickly? Um, uh, I, I totally agree, Beth. And I think that one of the positive aspects of um, the pre President Biden's uh, speech to the General Assembly was that he actually subordinated this notion of, you know, this is a, a pivotal moment in the contest between autocracies and democracies and actually spoke about, look, this is about, uh, you know, fundamental rules and norms of international law and the UN Charter uh, that everybody should be able to get behind, um, notwithstanding, you know, whatever, whatever the regime type happens to be. So I, I agree with you. And then, as you mentioned, pivoting to really concrete issues uh, that matter, like the fact that in crushing inflation, we're creating huge amounts of spillovers for all these countries. But of course, we have to be able to deliver on those concrete issues, right? I mean, it's one thing to talk about them it's, and, and, and demonstrate that we, uh, we recognize them, but in some way, we have to be able to, to provide concrete results. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, there's a, there's real questions about, you know, I mean, the president's capacity to deliver. I mean, he's probably uh, going he's got a bit of the wind of it, wind at his sails, um, you know, with respect to um, COP27, for instance, because, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act has really, really helped um, and, and increase the credibility of his, you know, his ability to deliver. And that act itself, particularly on the climate provisions, uh, are not are not easily overturned um, by even a Republican majority uh, uh, who has the purse strings in in the House if that's what it uh, happens to be. Uh, but absolutely, um, the ability to deliver um, on, on climate financing, for instance, the Biden administration has made a lot of pledges, but they haven't come through, and so there's a huge amount of skepticism and resentment in the developing world right now. Great. Let's turn from here to the Biden Xi uh, meeting. Evan, uh, can you get us started on this? Uh, uh, on this topic, which I know everyone is uh, is thinking about and, and will be watching closely. I mean, what should we be looking for? I mean, it, some people are wondering whether there's a chance of some kind of a, a, a breakthrough. Is, is this actually about, you know, concrete policy progress or concrete uh, improvement in diplomatic relations? Or is this more a question of tone and optics? Is that what we should be looking for when we when we watch this meeting? I think the reality is somewhere in between. It's not just tone and optics. Those are important. <clears throat> and it's not just about deliverables because it's pretty unlikely they're gonna generate any deliverables. I, I think fundamentally what it's about is since this will be the first in-person meeting that the both, the, both the leaders have had since Biden became president, um, it will be the sixth, sixth time that they've had a conversation and basically, since their last conversation, the relationship has not been going very well. You know, some people say it's in free fall, uh, you know, driven by many dynamics. But the Taiwan issue obviously is at the forefront, given the enhanced PLA Chinese military presence, you know, around the island of Taiwan. So I think what this meeting is about is um, both sides, for different reasons, basically want to put a floor under the relationship. I think on the U.S. side, it's about demonstrating that the relationship is not in free fall and that issues like Taiwan or even technology competition are not locked in a downward spiral dynamic. I think that's what Washington wants. I think what Beijing wants is basically to take the temperature down in the relationship for a couple of reasons. Number one, Xi Jinping simply has a lot of problems to deal with at home. Zero COVID in the econ economy are very prominent, completing the leadership transition because it's not really going to be done until March. So that's important to make sure that both the transition of the Communist Party as well as the transition in government, um, you know, get completed. But it also it harkens back to the issue I raised before. Xi Jinping demonstrating to the world, but in particular to the developing world, that um, you know, that Xi Jinping, now that he has his third term, uh, can act like a responsible global leader. He's trying to project that image of, of being a global statesman, which is important for his own domestic validation now that he's gotten his third term. So I think he does want to project that image, and that was reflected most recently in the trip of the German chance chancellor, um, you know, to Beijing, given the... Uh, 
the um, deterioration in China's relations with Europe since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So for different reasons, uh, both sides have come together and decided, okay, let's see if we can stabilize this thing. Um, from the U.S. perspective, it's all about stabilizing the relationship by enhancing communication, improving understanding on issues where there's lots of misperception like Taiwan, uh, and then perhaps getting some limited episodic cooperation on big global issues. Uh, food security and emerging market debt and climate change are probably the three most prominent ones. I'm pretty skeptical they're going to be able to get much of an agreement on anything because the traditional Chinese approach is, great, we're happy to cooperate with you. What are you willing to pay us to do it? But I do think that both sides will come out of this meeting because they, they have their own reasons for projecting an image of managing well the most important strategic relationship in the world. I think it, the, the optics coming out of this will generally be pretty positive. I think Biden having the opportunity to talk with Xi Jinping personally and directly about the Taiwan issue is helpful. I don't think it's going to solve the Taiwan issue. I think the Chinese are genuinely... Uh, at best confused about U.S.-Taiwan policy, but probably, um, you know, believing that the U.S. is moving away from the traditional principles of things like one China policy. So the, the meeting is somewhere between pure optics and, you know, chunky deliverables. There, there are real, there is a real conversation that needs to happen between both sides about perceptions, about policies, maybe even about personnel, given the changes on the Chinese side. And, but the question to me, the real question is um, how long is this going to last? Because I'm pretty confident the, the, the meeting will, both leaders will be able to achieve what they want to achieve. The question is how long is it going to last? Um, given some of the actions the US Congress has, has, or the Republicans have already said they're likely to take, does it create a domestic political environment that either constrains the president or members of Congress take actions like lots of trips to Taiwan uh, that make his management of the relationship much, much worse. So you sort of have the domestic, uh, you know, political peace, I think, is going to be uh, problematic. And then secondly, you have an election in Taiwan. Um, the presidential election is going to be in January of 2024. That means by the second quarter of 23 the Taiwan election cycle is going to pick up. And if you've got a bunch of candidates saying things that the Chinese don't like, and the Chinese um, begin to worry about the prospect of a third president of Taiwan from the Democratic, uh, you know, from the DPP, the ruling party right now, uh, that could lead them to increase their military presence, start to squeeze Taiwan even more, perhaps eliciting a U.S. response. So the, so. Let, let's see how long this relative stability is going to last. But it's it's what's interesting to me is from a sort of broad, broader strategic perspective is how freighted this bilateral meeting is mm -hmm. with historical and strategic significance, right? There are commentators talking about being it, this meeting being the first superpower summit of the new Cold War, right? Cold War version 2.0, right? Is this... Khrushchev Kennedy, 1961, right? The year before the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? We could go on and on uh, talking about the analogies. And these are genuinely interesting questions. But nonetheless, this is a meeting that's freighted with an enormous amount of meaning. But I think the real question is going to be, what are they going to be able to accomplish in terms of communication and understanding, less so on the deliverables front, and then how long is it going to last? Over to you, Chris. So it sounds like before I go to um, to, to Beth uh, and, and Stuart for, for their thoughts on this, it sounds like your, your, your analysis is actually somewhat cautiously optimistic that at least the relationship which has been deteriorating now for several years could be set on a, or could be pointed towards somewhat more stable territory. And we might look back someday at this meeting as the, the point in which there was at least some change in direction or some effort to stabilize the relationship. Is, is it possible that there could also be a more negative outcome? I mean, could something go, go badly wrong that would actually rapidly accelerate the deterioration in the relationship that we've seen? Or, or is that really not, not likely? 
So I, I didn't mean to give an optimistic assessment. I'm not particularly optimistic. You know, I'm sort of neutral. In other words, both sides want to stabilize the relationship. I think both sides are going to be able to say the right things to stabilize the relationship, but none of the underlying problems are going to be resolved, right? Of course, yeah. And, and so all the sources of intensification of strategic competition will continue to exist, right? If we're lucky, we'll get the reopening of some of the communication channels that were either canceled or suspended after Pelosi's visit. But opening up communications with China, you know, as a veteran of the Obama administration doesn't really solve problems. Sometimes it's just a way to sort of let a little steam you know, steam out of the valve, so to speak. So I, I'm not particularly optimistic. I just think the summit is what it is. It will, as both sides conceive it, very likely to accomplish its aims, but that it it is unlikely to fundamentally shift the trajectory of strategic competition. I think, as I said, it will sort of buy a little bit of time, but there are a variety of external factors like Taiwan, like American domestic politics, like PLA modernization, especially on the nuclear front, that um, paints a pretty steep and linear trajectory for the intensification of this strategic competition. Let, let me say here that this is fantastic, and we've already covered uh, a, a, a fantastic amount of territory. Uh, I want to I want to go to uh, Stuart and, and Beth um, for sort of closing thoughts here on on this or on any other issues. But let me throw. One question that we have haven't discussed, but that has been raised by our audience, which is uh, how does the the Ukraine war, Russia's war on Ukraine, factor in this? Is there is there is there any likelihood that discussions, uh, either especially at the G20, but but anywhere else, could have some kind of an effect on uh, on the on the unfolding of of that conflict? I'll just put that out there if you if you want to answer it. But Stuart, let, let me go to you first for anything that you want to add uh, at this point as we as we're bringing this to a close yeah sure uh, just on my the, the the audience members question or the participants question I, I, that's really interesting i my sense is that that this will not be um an occasion where um where um any sort of a um, settlement uh, or move towards a denouement some sort of armistice or negotiation tour that even 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 um mulling that out in the open is going to be something that the united states would be uh, enthusiastic about uh or the west partly given their desire not to allow this to happen and, and to get ahead of the, the Ukrainians themselves. Um, so I think that um, I, I, I would I, I think that the, the Biden administration will continue on sort of the UN charter basis to try to criticize and and get others to at least get on board with the fact that the that Russia's behavior is out, out of the pale. Um, I, I'm interested on the on the prospects for uh, Chinese uh, U.S. cooperation and the fact that and this framing is as a you know a new a new new Cold War. Um, uh, sort of bilateral uh, meeting. Um, uh, and I think that, um, you know, the lesson of the pandemic uh, and, and they, then the lesson of the fall of the, of the war in Ukraine is that, um, you know, the, the geopolitical rivalry and strategic rivalry between um, uh, the U.S. and China um, is is really one of the major impediments to the actual uh, functioning of, of the G20. So if there can be in this bilateral summit an, an effort to sort of cool the temperature, um, you know, as Evan was saying, I do think that and, and, and an agreement to, in a sense, um, compartmentalize certain um, certain issues that have gotten that have been victims of spillover from this um, from geopolitics. I think that would be a huge step forward. And I, th I do think the climate uh, is an opportunity there. That doesn't mean they have to totally agree on their approach to climate. Uh, uh, but and actually, they, in some ways, some some you know friendly or or at least uh, parallel competition in terms of who's going to dominate the clean energy uh, uh, industries of tomorrow could actually that could be a healthy form of competition for the fate of the planet and the fate of all of us. So I, I do think that might be a possibility. Chris, can I come in because I thought Please, uh, yeah. Stuart made a, a great point. So these three possible areas of cooperation: food security, climate change, and EM debt. I think are all ones that are clearly on the G20 agenda, right? G20 created the common framework for managing EM debt problems. The issue to date has been the Chinese don't, don't aren't interested in doing this multilaterally, um, right? They're not part of the common framework uh, in doing the, you know, the debt workouts of both Ecuador and Zambia. Uh, the Chinese have not been particularly transparent, right? They haven't used the common framework. And so I think one of the challenges is that the Chinese prefer to do these things bilaterally 
because China has more leverage and freedom of maneuver bilaterally. And importantly, the Chinese believe that they get more credit, more leverage, political leverage from doing these things bilaterally. And so to Stuart's very good point, I think that the G20 is the place to develop common standards, common principles, and to address the collective action problems. I think to date, though, you know, Xi Jinping has been, you know, has been so concerned that the U.S. dominates the G20. He looks at the U.S.-China relationship in such, you know, um, competitive terms um, that you haven't had that any any opportunity to cooperate. Um, I, I think the question going forward is, as Beth pointed out, if the Chinese are really engaged in this sort of charm offensive toward the developing world, which they see as a constituency that will help them in their long term competition with the United States and capitalist democracies, you know, Russia, BRICS, the developing world, then perhaps that provides some motivation for them to do a little bit more within the G20. You know, hard, hard to tell. I think this G20 will be an interesting test because they're definitely, you know, very much in the middle of this sort of developing country charm offensive. Um, you have a new leader, a new foreign policy leadership in China, Wang Yi, and he's, you know, uh, obviously a very uh, experienced, if not skilled, diplomat. So I would say, you know, um, perhaps this G20 is a test of sorts where you have this convergence of China wanting to stabilize relations with the U.S., China engaged in this chart offensive toward the developing world, and Xi Jinping wanting to present himself to the world, you know, as a, you know, as a, a great influential uh, leader post-party Congress. You know, perhaps those are um, proximate conditions that might open the door to doing something more in the G20. So I would say a great, great, great points and let, let's watch and see what happens. So again, you sound a little bit more optimistic, I think, than, than you want to be, uh, which, is, which is actually a good thing these days. Beth, let me see if, um, let me see if you have anything you wanna, you wanna add before yeah. we conclude this session, which has been excellent. Let's just say um, very quickly on the question about Ukraine. I actually think ASEAN is a place where we're going to see some positive things coming there. Kuleva, the foreign minister, is going to be there. They're going to sign an agreement on um, on a relationship with ASEAN. Um, and you know, remarkably, I think that there is a little bit more um, emphasis there. The G20, we're not going to see any changes. India has absolutely not changed its policy on engaging Russia, and you know, other key members like Saudi Arabia. The question we have not put on the table, which I think is absolutely key to many, many conversations here um, during this next week is North Korea. So there'll be a bi there'll be a trilat between Japan and South Korea and the U.S. managing that bilateral relationship and encouraging it really key. But, you know, for that C meeting, I would absolutely, if I were Biden, say mano a mano here. What are you going to do about North Korea's nuclear test coming up? Is this really what you want? Because let me tell you how we're going to react. This is not what you want. You don't want us more engaged on the peninsula. But this is where we're going because you're allowing North Korea to go down this path. So I think that there's a really big interest here on North Korea and um, and I'm guessing that Biden will have this conversation with Xi, and it will be very interesting private conversation. We'll see where he comes down if any of us find out about it. <laughs> I, I can guess. I mean, given China's <laughs> recent behavior and attitudes toward North Korea, you know, Not uh, going well. I think we're unlikely to see any significant shift in China's approach to North Korea, which is it's your problem, you deal with it. Uh, Beth, okay. you said there's going to be a trilateral meeting. Is that uh, at the leaders' level or foreign minister's level? At the leaders' level between South Korea and Japan. And oh, that's, Biden. Cool. that's important. Yeah. And I can so, remember in the Obama administration, we did this uh, in The Hague, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, I can remember. I think, this, I think this will be the second one, Evan, that they've had, um, the trilateral on I the margins of maybe, uh, yeah. you know, when he was out for the quad. And so it'll be either at ASEAN or G20 and just a very, very important um, right. alliance structure to keep building on. 
because China's not going to be helpful. <laughs> right. I mean, that's one of those meetings that has both good symbolic importance, the Chinese see solidarity among allies, but you know, given the leaders of Japan and Korea, your very, very practical things often come out of those meetings as well. So, um, you know, I agree that that's going to be important. And, you know, the North Korea issue is always central to the U.S.-China relationship. It's been a quiescent issue of late. But, you know, it's going to be one of those, again, another one of those tests. Are the Chinese going to be interested in, you know, constraining North Korea for the sake of global stability? Or are they going to treat the North Korea issue as something that's part of this geopolitical competition between America and China. Well, the stakes are, are obviously uh, significant um, and we'll all be watching over the course of the coming several days as all of this unfolds. Um, you know, again, I'm taken back to what Beth said at the start about uh, preparing the president for a trip like this and reminded again of the extraordinary amount of work that goes into it, uh, not just here in the United States, but also if you think about it around the world. So. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, time that we have ahead of us with these meetings, um, and, and I am just so appreciative to the three of you uh, to have joined us to this to, to try and talk about at least at least we covered some of the important topics, I feel like, uh, and did so uh, in a very interesting way. So thanks so much for your time, uh, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank thanks. you.